chapter 11. So we continue on in our study of the letter of Corinthians, the first letter to the church in Corinth. Going to read for us together from verse 17. The section we'll be focusing on is verse 23 to 34. 1 Corinthians 11 from verse 17. In the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when, he ha- when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give direction when I come. May the Lord bless the reading of this word. If you would turn your attention to verse 23, as I just read this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. I think it's very important here in light of the context of what Paul is writing here, saying that this unity in the church is the problem in the, in the church of Corinth, as they do not wait for one another at the Lord's Supper, and as the Lord's Supper indicates this division even further in the church, as you would partake of the Lord's Supper together with the Corinthians, you would possibly see these factions, these divisions, the enmity and the strife between the people in the church. And so when Paul writes as a corrective to the people and say to them, look, you're not um, taking the Lord's Supper because you're taking it in an unworthy way, he puts this context to describing the Lord's Supper. You know, as when we take the Lord's Supper together, I normally say, as Jesus partook of the last Passover with his disciples, so I'm putting that into the context of Jesus and his disciples at the last Passover partaking, Paul is saying, in other words here, the context in which the Lord's Supper was given was on the night when he was betrayed by one of his own disciples. He took bread and he broke it. And so what Paul is warning the Corinthian church of is not to be guilty of the same sin as the betrayer. Don't be guilty of the same sin as the betrayer, the one who betrayed Jesus. And so Paul goes off to tell us He received from the Lord what he's delivering to the church to tell us what the Lord's Supper is about. And so when he tells us in verse 24, do this in remembrance of me, this is my body, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And the same way with the cup, do this in remembrance of me. This word for remembrance is not just a vague memory of what happened 2,000 years ago. This remembrance, this memorial, is like when you think of your own family members, your father who maybe passed away, your grandfathers, your ancestors. And when you call to mind, you're not just thinking about these people 
remember, but how it impacts you. What did my grandfather have to do with me? How is it that certain things that my grandfather taught my father and my father taught me, how is it that it shapes me today? That's how we normally think of our family members, isn't it? Who have passed away. The same word here for that remembrance of Jesus. Remembering the impact his life, his death, and his resurrection had on me personally. So to remember the Lord Jesus Christ as he ordered us to do in the Lord's Supper is to remember how his death and his life and his resurrection impacted me. And so that's what we do when we partake of the Lord's Supper together. It's a time to reflect on the impact and the power and the difference and the transformation that the life and the work of Christ has in my life. But not only in my life personally, because you see, as long as you do this, you proclaim his death to you all. So you must not just think of the personal impact that the death of Christ means for me personally, but also the death of Christ, what it means for his body, the church. And here again, we come to that cliche truth that I continue to hammer upon. It is about the Lord Jesus and his people of which I am one. I continually need to think of my relationship with the Lord, with his people, and how I fit into that. That's the first and the second command, isn't it? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We have to think in these dimensions. And so, the remembrance of the death of Christ, remembering that his death is for the church and also for me. What is it that the Corinthian church is guilty of in the Lord's Supper? They have become poor or not become. It is evidence that they have become self-centered. And so the way they watch over the Lord's Supper has become evident that they are self-centered people. And so Paul is rectifying this. And so... Is setting them right. Your focus should not be on self, but your focus should be in remembrance of Christ. But then also, verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. What is it that the Corinthian Christians were proclaiming? And what is it that we sometimes in the church Maybe as individuals, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, what are some of the things that we might be guilty of when we partake of the Supper? We think of ourselves. I'm a Christian, I'm worthy to partake, and there are certain others who are not worthy to partake. And you think of yourself in a spiritually superior manner than others. And this is something that the Corinthian Christians were guilty of. Thinking of themselves more superior than their brothers and sisters in Christ. But here is... Paul's remedy, verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, and it's not just a you individual, it's you all, you the church, proclaim. You are saying, in other words, as a congregation, as a people, the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died for our sins, the sins of the church, so that we might be rescued from the world. God will have for himself a people. To put it in other words, Jesus Christ is the head of the new humanity of which the church has been made part of that new humanity in Christ. In Christ we have come under the new headship. We are leaving the headship of Adam which leads to death and condemnation. And we have come under the headship of Christ Jesus. To say it another way, in line with what we've read in our scripture reading this week from Second Chronicles, you would see that the people of Israel were under different kings, kings of Judah, and when they worshipped the Lord, and when their hearts, and this is the test, if you go read Second Chronicles, there was wholehearted obedience and wholehearted devotion, and there were some instances where the kings did what the Lord commanded, but their whole heart was not in it. And that made all the difference. There's a wholehearted obedience needed by the king. And when the king is obeyed and they wholeheartedly follow the Lord, it went well with the whole kingdom. Now, isn't that also part of the gospel? That we have a king, the Lord Jesus Christ. At what point in that new kingdom that is come, is God ever displeased with his son, Jesus Christ? Never. 
At which points are God displeased with you and me? Every day. Every day because of my sin and because of the state that I'm in. Because the kingdom does not revolve around me. And how well it will go with the kingdom does not depend upon my obedience, you see. How well does it go with the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ depends upon him and him alone. Why is it not going well in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why is it that there, if we look around us, we see not everything is going well in the kingdom of Christ, is it? Well, why is it not going well? It's not because the king is rebelling, but it's because the subjects rebel against the good king, just like you see in Second Chronicles. In certain aspects, when the king says certain things, you have the rebels coming, you have the enemies coming. So you have people within rebelling against the good worship. And then you see the problems in the kingdom. And so this is some of the things that Paul needs to address. Don't be a rebellious church, he tells the Corinthians in other words. Don't rebel against the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about his death, his resurrection. Think about your Lord who died for you and the difference that makes in the life of the church and in the life of the believer. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord. And so this proclamation here is very similar to the proclamation that the apostles do. You see, as the preacher or the pastor or the apostle or the one preaching, he's not the only one who's heralding out the gospel to unbelievers or to the world. Why are we not successful in evangelism and missions work? Is it because we need better pastors to preach better messages? Maybe what we need is churches who proclaim the truth of the death and the resurrection of Christ by the way that they live much better. These two things go hand in hand. I'm not saying that we don't need pastors who preach well. I'm trying to excuse myself here. We need both. It's a both and. We need to work together on this. The church has a particular responsibility to proclaim the death of Christ, as have the pastor from the pulpit. And when these two things match up, when what the pastor says is what the church then does, there is an integrity that comes with a church, or that goes with the image of that church. This church truly believes what is preached from the pulpit when God says this is what the truth of his word proclaims, and this is what the people believe. And so the question then that Paul is alluding to or coming to in First Corinthians with them is, do you truly believe these things that I'm saying to you? And Paul knows that they truly believe these things because they once believed it before. They believed it before. And so what Paul is getting at is, your faith has been shaken and you need to progress again to sureness of your faith. Look at verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. So here Paul is coming to each individual Christian in Corinth and saying, here is your individual responsibility within the church, in other words. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, this is not meant as a verse so that you may reflect on every other time you have already taken of the Lord's Supper and feel guilty for those times. This is a call to repentance and renewal and to make yourself ready for the next time that you will take of the Lord's Supper together. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, you see it's not is an unworthy person receiving the Lord's Supper. It's partaking in an unworthy manner. It's an adverb and an adjective describing the way of doing it. And so you must think of when you do this again, of partaking in a worthy manner and not an unworthy manner. Whoever partakes of the cup, eats of the bread in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now that thinks back to the context that Paul gave on the night when he was betrayed. On the night when he was betrayed. And so what Paul is alluding to, remember the first time that Jesus instituted this Lord's Supper? He had his true disciples with him. 
They were some of his disciples, the one disciple who would betray him, and the others who would partake of the supper with. But there was this one disciple who walked with all the others throughout Jesus' ministry, intimately walking with him, seeing the power of the kingdom through the king, and yet did not believe it, but betrayed that very Lord to his enemies. And so this is the test for us, an, an unworthy manner of partaking of the Lord's Supper, which would be to walk like Judas, who walked with the disciples, saying, I'm a disciple, I'm a disciple, I'm a disciple, but hating, despising the king. And so, the question and the test for you, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? And to love the Lord Jesus Christ further implies you love his church, you love his bride. You cannot love the Lord Jesus Christ without loving his bride. You cannot love the Lord Jesus Christ and despise and hate his church. You have to love the Lord by loving his church as well. So whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And here this body of the Lord, guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, will see that Paul has sometimes meaning this body as Christ's body on the cross, but also Christ's body as the church is his body. And we'll see these uses interwoven in the text. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28, Paul then gives this instruction. He says, let a person examine himself. Here is the worthy manner of partaking. So when you ask the question, how is it that I might partake worthily? Let a person examine himself. So self-examination. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Through the self-examination. In this way, examining himself. Examining in light of what was said before. Remembrance of me. Partake of the bread in remembrance of me. Partake of that cup in remembrance of me. Examining yourself in the light of the death of Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Christ's death on the cross was not just an event that happened and then somehow a pastor of today has to somehow relate that to me and somehow convince me that that was for me. But if I'm a Christian, I really understand that when Christ died, He died for me, for my sins. How do I know because the Holy Spirit in my heart falls now with my spirit as a father because I've heard the gospel of truth and past. Do these things mean anything for me? And God assures me in my heart, yes, it has everything to do with it. So that the assurance that you have as a Christian is not the assurance of some pastor who told you, well, you're a Christian now. But the assurance is the assurance from the Holy Spirit and from God Himself convincing you in your heart this was for you. You need to be convinced of the love of God by God Himself. Do you know the love of Christ for you? Do you know the love of Christ for you? How will you know the love of Christ for you? Well, it is preached that Christ died so that sinners may come to Him. Are you a sinner that has come to Christ? Are you a sinner who has confessed your sins to Him? Are you a sinner in desperate need of the Savior that cries to Him and calls to Him? Or are you a sinner who despises this King, despises the Lord? You see, that would mean that you would partake of the Lord's Supper if you do partake in an unworthy way. And so, the Lord says, do this in remembrance of me. Examine yourself, says Paul. Do you truly believe in Christ? And so in this examination, what you are evaluating is you are evaluating your own faith. You're evaluating the genuineness, the truthfulness of your own faith. Do I really believe in this? And this might even be a small faith, like the faith of the man in Mark 9. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You see, you don't come to the Lord in the Lord's table with a faith that you produced by yourself. 
That's not genuine faith. A faith produced by himself will not be found to be a genuine faith because the genuine faith that saves is the faith that is a gift from God. Faith in his son Jesus Christ because the faith here is a persuasion, godly persuasion of the truth. God persuades you of the truth that his son died for you and for us. Believe it. This should raise proper caution when we partake of the Lord's Supper. We should not be casual about this table because it's not about us. It's not about my worthiness before the Lord, but it's all about the obedience to the gospel, obedience to Christ Jesus. And so when we see the Lord's Supper in this way, we can also see the similarities between the Lord's Supper and baptism. We see the similarities between the ordinances of Christ. In the baptism we proclaim we come under the lordship of Christ and we are permitted to wholehearted obedience. In the Lord's Supper we proclaim the lordship of Christ and come under his roof. And we say that we are wholeheartedly obedient to him. In baptism that's the individual aspect of it where I say I commit to be part of his kingdom. And in the Lord's Supper, we say we are part of His kingdom. So, you see the principles of the Baptist Church. You see how Baptist principles reflect in this truth as well. In the first principle, we believe in the direct worship of Christ over the individual and the worship of Christ over the whole congregation. Express in this truth. We even show it then by the Ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so the same faith that is required to approach God in baptism is the same faith that is required in the Lord's Supper. But you see, for us, the complexity then in the Lord's Supper is more than the complexity in baptism. What do I mean by the complexity of this? Well, it's easy enough to commit myself to one person. If I can use the illustration of a marriage, it's easy to commit myself to my wife. But this new relationship, me to my wife, will need to be worked out through the rest of our marriage. We had seven years of working this out already. We'll have many more years of working this out. Of how we relate to her parents, how we relate to my parents, how we relate to her uncles, to my uncles, to our kids, to you see. It has to work itself out. And so we build a life together. This is the same truth in the church. I commit to the Lord Jesus Christ as he is committed to me. It's a public declaration of faith coming under the lordship of Christ. And then it needs to be demonstrated in our life. And it must be demonstrated in our life, not there in a form, but along with all the other subjects of the same kingdom. And that finds its expression in the church. In the church, we say we are the servants of Christ. We have come under his lordship. And so we partake together of this new kingdom. And so we are under the lordship of Christ. And we are committed wholeheartedly to obedience. Not just for the things that I am personally responsible for. But now there is also a corporate responsibility of the church. What are some of the things that are our corporate responsibility? What are some of the things that we are, as a church, responsible for together? We're responsible for the Great Commission. Go and make disciples for all nations. Teaching them to obey all things. This was a commandment given to all of the disciples. So that they may work together in doing this. Otherwise, what we would see in the book of Acts is 12 apostles going in 12 different directions, starting 12 churches, and then... Each of them having their own church, having to propagate that, and no unity between all of them. What do we see in the book of Acts? All of the churches that they planted, it's one church under the Lordship of Christ that's finding its expression in local congregations throughout the world. Just like we see today. The question is, are we an obedient church to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you see, just as we as individual Christians have a responsibility to keep unity with one another, we as the church together have the responsibility to keep unity with the churches around us as well. 
because we have one Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have a responsibility to carry ourselves as such. Look at verse 29, the warning here for a person who does not take this seriously, who does, who does not come to the Lord's Supper with this serious reflection, who comes to it casually participating as if it means nothing. Or anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, and the, without discerning the body here is not the body and the blood referring to Jesus' body, but discerning the body here is are we not members of the same body by partaking of the same blood? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, help us. Verse 17, because there is one bread, we who are many of one body, for we are all partake of one bread. So if anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So in recognizing the death of Christ having an impact on my life, Having uh, shedding a light on my personal life, also recognizing that in my personal life I'm conducting it in line with God's purpose of gathering His church, His body, being unified with one. In other words, I know my place. And so it's not for me to say to you, know your place, and to be a tyrant about it because it's not my kingdom. I'm only a herald of the truth of the kingdom of Christ. He tells you to get in your place. As he tells me to get in my place sometimes. And so we must get in line with what our Lord has for us. We are unified, we are made one by the death of Christ. We are knit together as one fellowship for the glory of his name. And so that's what we need to discern when we eat and drink the Lord's Supper. We proclaim his death, we say in other words, he is our Lord, we are the church. Not only saying I am a Christian, you're saying we are the church. I am a Christian, we are the church. Do you remember that scheme that I had up last year about who is Christ, who is the church, what is the church, what is a Christian? You see, we as Christians individually relate to him by faith, hope, and love. The church relates to him through the preaching of the word, through the ordinances administered, and through the discipline. All of these aspects need to hold together because therein we find our identity as individual Christians, but also as Christians with a family name. When, when, you, when you introduce yourself, you introduce your first name, but also your last name. But to your family members, you don't introduce your last name because everyone knows your last name. But to the world or to someone else, someone stranger, you introduce your first and last name so that you may say to which family you are. And so the same thing goes in the church. We call one another by first names because we are part of the same family. We all have the same family name. But we must live as people who truly have the same family name. Now what is the result then of the way that the Corinthian church is conducting themselves in their day? Verse 34 says, That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Referring to verse 29, whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body drinks a judgment on himself. How can Paul evaluate if they're discerning the body or not? Paul knows that they're not discerning the body because it shows in their fruit the way they behave. So this discerning in the body is not just a simple way of thinking. We should be able to see whether or not we are discerning the body or not. We can evaluate if we as a church are discerning the body of Christ or not. How do we evaluate if we're discerning the body of Christ or not? We evaluate this in the unit that we exhibit as we have fellowship with one another. Is there constant bickering about certain things or not? And I, I'm happy to say that this church has grown immensely. Our congregation has grown a lot. In being a knit together family that loves one another, cares for one another, and prays for one another. But then why pray about these things if it's not a problem? Or, or preach about these things if it's not a problem for us? Well, it shouldn't become a problem again. And we should continue on holding up to know what is the right thing to do and what are the wrong things that we should not be doing. So that we are careful to obey the Lord. And we must guard what we have 
so that what happened to the Corinthian church may not happen to us. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. You see, it's very serious. Verse 31, and here is something very interesting which I've only noticed recently. Verse 31, if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. You see, there's a self-examination called for in verse 28, but here, verse 31, there's almost a corporate evaluation of ourselves. You see? If we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. You see, he's speaking here of a judgment that has come upon the whole church in Corinth. Yes, individuals were guilty of this, but also the whole church then as a body of Christ was guilty. And therefore, judgment has come upon them. But notice what Paul says about this judgment. Verse 32, when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. This is not condemned by the Lord. This is judgment to discipline us. When we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. And here is the reason for the discipline. Why is God so severe with us when we don't follow His will? Because He's disciplining us so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So that we may not be condemned along with the world. And so you see, when we come together for the Lord's Supper, there's no reason for a Christian who believes and who is linked to Christ not to partake of the Lord's Supper. Because we cannot, in that sense, even bring a judgment over ourselves leading to condemnation. You see? We cannot eat and drink a judgment that leads to condemnation. We eat and drink maybe a judgment that leads to discipline. Just like your father or your mother tells you, I don't want to have to give you punishment when you do wrong. So the Lord, with tears in his eyes, will discipline you. Not because he revels in your discipline and in your pain, but because he loves you and does not want you to be condemned. That's why our parents sometimes <coughs> tell us, no, you cannot go to that party. No, you cannot mix with those friends. No, you cannot do this. It's for your own benefit, for your own soul, for your own well-being. God knows how to take care of our souls. Woe to us when we think we can take care of ourselves and our own souls. Woe to you when you think that you can take care of your own soul better than the Lord so be careful. Be careful then when you partake of the Lord's Supper that you do it in an obedient manner so that you may receive from God commendation. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Isn't that what we want for all of us? To partake of the Lord's Supper in this way where we all may commend one another. But when we are judged by the Lord, verse 32, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, and here Paul applies it specifically to the Corinthian church, he gives these two instructions in verse 33 and 34. Verse 33, he says, wait for one another, and if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Because what was happening in the Corinthian church, some of those who came together and had their food, they were not waiting for the others. And so they were eating their meals in front of the poor. And so they were eating the meal without waiting for their brothers and sisters, and if anyone is hungry. And so the other thing is, some came to the Lord's Supper to indulge in their appetite. And so they came for the sake of their stomach, and not for the sake of their soul. And that's why Paul says here, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So don't just come to feed your carnal appetite, but come and feed your spiritual appetite in the Lord's Supper. And so then, when you come together, wait for one another, partake together, this tells us how we are to partake of the Lord's Supper together as a church, waiting for one another. That's why we don't rush through the Lord's Supper. We partake patiently, we wait for one another, we partake together of the one road. You know, that's why we why we do it the way we do. 
eating the bread together, drinking the cup together. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give direction when I come. And so Paul has covered the most important things in the meantime for the Corinthians. He tells them, I will come to you and give you direction when I come. And so maybe Paul here has given them the instruction, and he will show them by example when he gets there. I think it would help us as we have gone through this now to see how we as a church also need to be praying for one another. So as we make ready every every month to partake of the Lord's Supper in the morning service and then also in the evening service, remember to examine yourself. Remember to pray for the brothers and sisters who are also going through that self-examination. And then uh, encourage one another. Because the Lord's Supper is meant to feed our faith. It's not meant to be a terrifying thing where the Lord rules over us as a terrifying dictator. Do this or else. It's meant to be an encouragement to our faith. Because this is exactly what the Lord comes to do in the Lord's Supper. Is to make His Word tangible to us. So that we may partake by faith and be encouraged to partake faithfully. Serious. Because our faith is a matter of life and death. If the Lord help us, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us your word, that your word gives us direction, that it causes us to reflect on our own life our own life, which does not belong to us, but was purchased by the blood of Christ. And so we belong to you because you have made us, but also we belong to you because you have redeemed us. And so, Father, we pray that you continue to lead us, to grow us together in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we are led closer to him as individuals, we thank you, O Lord, that this also results in a closer walk with your people. We pray that you may continue to knit us together as a fellowship. And so may we encourage every individual Christian to have a closer walk with God and to desire for them to have a closer walk with us. And may we, O oh Lord, not be a stumbling block to them, but may we be an encouragement and a help as we pray for them, as we encourage them. May we also experience, O oh Lord, the encouragement and the prayer of our brothers and sisters in the church. May our congregation be to the glory of Christ our Lord. In his name we pray.